Wednesday, March 16th, and this is now on HNN. He was a person of compassion. A man brutally murdered at his Hawaii Loa Ridge home is remembered as caring and kind. Coming up, what his family is saying about the suspect's statements. If you have people coming from the west end of the island, traveling all this distance to fall you know, a little more than a mile short. We have reaction to the city's new plan to stop the embattled rail project short of Ala Moana Center. We understand that high inflation imposes significant hardship. Interest rates are going up. I'm Michael George, and I'll tell you how it will affect everything from loans to prices at the grocery store. These stories plus a new option to catch a ride out of this world. That's coming up on This Is Now. A powerful earthquake struck northern Japan, but there's no tsunami threat to Hawaii, according to the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. The 7.3 magnitude quake struck around 4.35 a.m. Hawaii time off the coast of Fukushima, cutting power to millions of homes and prompting a tsunami advisory around the Fukushima prefecture. That's where a 2011 earthquake caused a disaster at a nuclear power plant. That tsunami advisory has since been canceled. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said no injuries were reported from the initial quake, but at least seven people were injured during aftershocks. Officials urged the public to watch out for more seismic activity in the next few days. Good afternoon and thank you for watching. This is now. Let's get to the latest on the Hawaii Law Ridge murder investigation. We're learning more about the victim who was found encased in concrete last week. Let's toss it over to Jonathan and Casey for more on that. So Casey H&N has been speaking with the victim's family. What we learn? Well, we've learned that 73-year-old Gary Ruby moved to the state of Hawaii uh, to work for the state back in the 70s. He moved here from Montreal, Canada. The murder suspect, Juan Brown, told police that he strangled Ruby after they had sex because he says that Ruby told him he had HIV. Ruby's niece told us his family doesn't believe that. Our managing editor, Daryl Huff, asked Maya Ruby Clemens about the statements that Barone made to investigators. Tell me what you thought about the statements that were made to uh, the police by the suspect in this, in this case. I think you wanted to say something about that. I just find them to be not in keeping with the person that I know my uncle to be. Um, and that I believe all of his friends that I've had the chance since his passing to connect with have said he was. My uncle kept a very close group of friends for a long time, which means these are people with depth of knowledge about him. And so I really, really trust what they've had to say about him. And he was a person of compassion, honor, kindness, and caring. And the statements that he would Tell someone he was HIV positive after having sex does not ring true. Um, I, I can't, I can't even begin to fathom that that would have happened. I, you know, had he been HIV positive, and, and that to me would be a surprise as well. That wasn't something known to the family. Ruby Clemens also shared some memories about her uncle, who she says was a great man with a great sense of humor and very kind. He absolutely loved the lifestyle in Hawaii and loved the sun and the beach. Um, and, and just, I think the culture and the acceptance that was there, the house was his life dream and, and he worked hard to have that home. And, you know, despite where it's located in the money, he wasn't a flashy person. He was the kind of person who would choose a classic piece of clothing and, and wear that piece of clothing for years because it, it was what he liked. And so he was not flashy. And Casey, before I let you go, what do we know about the suspect? What's the latest there? Well, right now, Barone is in L.A. He was found in California, you may remember, after fleeing Hawaii when Ruby's body was found at his Hawaii Lower Ridge home. We also know that authorities have been granted clearance from a judge to extradite him back to Hawaii. Now, in court documents, police said Barone confessed again to fatally choking 73-year-old victim Gary Ruby with a belt 
Barron told police that he then dragged the victim's body to a bathtub in the victim's home and used a kitchen knife to slit his wrist in an attempt to stage a suicide. In the documents, police say Barron discovered bags of concrete in Gary's garage, filled the bathtub with concrete to conceal the body. The suspect then allegedly pur purchased more concrete at a hardware store before covering the mixture with coffee grounds, and that was in an attempt to hide the smell. Yeah, very disturbing case, and we'll continue to update you on This Is Now. Thank you, Casey, very much. Let's toss it over to Ashley with more news. Police are looking for a man who allegedly ran from a deadly gunfight in Waianae yesterday morning. HPD says the owner of a house at Pokai Kuahivi Place was trying to negotiate the return of a firearm that was recently stolen. We're told three suspects drove to the home in an SUV, then an argument broke out, resulting in shots fired. Police say one suspect was killed and three others were injured. A third suspect fled the scene on foot. Um, a male right outside of his car on the floor with blood all over him. And when we came outside, um, a guy who was turning around said that he's been shot. Scared. And, you know, we, got, we all got kids over here. So even more, it doesn't feel like safe. Been here for a while, and that's the first time we ever heard that kind of stuff go off. Police say the man who ran from the scene was wearing a T-shirt and camouflaged pants. It's up to the prosecutor to sort out who might face charges. The city wants to stop construction of the Honolulu Rail Project at South Street in Kaka'ako. Mayor Blangiardi says his plan still brings mass transit to major population centers, but it does not connect with Hawaii's largest mall. As Jolani Martinez reports, some condos and businesses have already gone up where those rail stations are supposed to be built. Honolulu's final rail station is supposed to be built on Kona Street near Ka'ao Moku, giving people access to here, Ala Moana Shopping Center, but with the mayor's proposed route. It would stop here at Hale Kawila and South Streets, where the Civic Center station will be constructed. The plan to build the line to Ala Moana was set in writing by Mayor Carlisle when he applied for federal funding a full decade ago. Since then, transit-oriented developments have sprung up all around the final two stops. What you really wanted was high-rises on all these stations so that you had ridership going either west or east or otherwise. You need ridership going forward so uh, that you can pay for this. Station 20 was supposed to go in just east of Ward Avenue. The city bought up land and has been involved in multiple lawsuits over the route. Station 21 would have been in Hawaii's largest mall. Many of the condos at Sky Ala Moana are marketed specifically as being near the Ala Moana rail station. If you have people coming from the west end of the island traveling all this distance to fall you know, a little more than a mile short to Ala Moana, I mean, Ala Moana is definitely a highly visible and recognizable place where everybody wants to try and uh, get to. Pretty inconvenient. I don't think I would use it. Some are disappointed at the new proposal. Let's get moving on it and get our money, what we have left, to start putting in our sewer systems, our roads, and rebuilding Honolulu the way it needs to be. Honolulu looks very, very tired right now, and we have to revitalize it. In my mind, the mayor acted very logically because it was simply a cost-cutting measure in order to get the rail funded with limited resources and very limited political support. Real estate expert Ricky Cassidy acknowledges that certain developers will lose money. My best guess is that the lawyers that drafted the agreements left open uh, the possibility that this would not uh, occur and, and it would be beyond their control. Therefore, if they're not in control, they couldn't get sued. It's called the force majeure. The biggest developer in Kaka'ako, Howard Hughes, said it could not comment because of litigation. It's demanding that Hart pay millions for access to property for the rail. Jolani Martinez, Hawaii News Now. Interim HPD Chief Roddy Vanek has asked for his name to be withdrawn from consideration for HPD's next chief. Sources say Vanek told his assistant chiefs yesterday during a meeting and cited personal reasons. 
We're told Vanek will continue to be in charge until the police commission picks a permanent chief out of the remaining 18 candidates for the job. The Navy is launching a supplemental investigation into the Red Hill water crisis, specifically focusing on the Navy's response to the leaks last May and November. The Navy said its initial command investigation ordered last year did not sufficiently review those actions. Rear Admiral James Waters will oversee this new investigation. No timeline was provided. Ukraine's president addressed Congress virtually today. For the latest on that, let's bring in Hawaii News Now's chief national political analyst, Greta Van Susteren. Now, Greta, what were the main takeaways from the address? Well, first of all, he asked to address Congress, which is interesting. That's sort of the, you know, sort of the local color to it. But he was speaking not just to Congress in the room, but also to the President of the United States and to the American people who are following and, all, of course, all the news organizations, because he's trying to get the message back, which is essentially this. He says, look, we need help. We, meaning Ukraine, need help. And he needs more help in terms of money, but he's also looking for some specific things. Um, he's looking for some MiG fighter planes. He wants those. That was, a pro that was a plan last week from Poland that President Biden next. And he also wants a NATO no-fly zone over his country, something that President Biden also next. So he, he basically said, look, we need help. And he invoked both 9-11 and Pearl Harbor because those things, you know, we really get as American about being attacked. So he, he hit, you know, he, he mentioned those things. But that was the whole thing is, please help me. Right. There has been, you know, global pressure on President Biden to kind of step up the U.S.'s role in this crisis and also some pressure domestically here at home. I know he announced $800 million in aid for Ukraine. What does that cover? Well, the 800 million is to help it to provide military security and so they can buy what, the, what Ukraine wants to buy. But look, you know, one of the, let me just explain why, you know, there's pressure on President Biden to sort of step it up. But here's what President Biden is worried about. And it's not necessarily an irrational worry. He's worried that if he steps up, if he gets more involved, if NATO gets involved, a NATO no-fly zone, for instance, or if the U.S. gets involved with transferring those, those uh, MiG planes from Poland, which is a NATO country, to U.S., which is a NATO country, to Ukraine, is that Putin will see that as an escalation, that, that, that he'll give that as a reason to escalate things, saying now NATO's involved in this. And when, he, and when you talk about escalation, of course, you talk about, uh, you know, about, about Putin going further, taking on other countries as well as he's got he's got incredible um, uh, he's got a lot of nuclear weapons and he's got chemical weapons so president biden is sort of he wants to help ukraine but sort of put the lid on it as not to not to have putin see that as sort of a false flag that help so that he escalates what he does because that would be it's catastrophic it's already catastrophic what's happened to ukraine and to the people but it could get worse Right, absolutely. And President Biden is heading to Brussels uh, for a NATO conference. What's expected to be discussed there? President Biden wants to, wants to send a message to Putin that, look, uh, NATO is aligned. You know, Putin has for so many months has tried, tried, to draw, tried to drive a divide within NATO, saying that not everyone in NATO countries was on the same page. Well, President Biden showing up, showing the resolve of, the, of that alliance and showing how strong it is. So that's the reason he's doing that. He also needs to show, he also wants to talk to people about this no-fly zone, this NATO no-fly zone, which he's opposed to, and about, and about the uh, transfer of, of the MiG uh, planes, that, uh, fighter planes that I just mentioned. So it's, it's basically sort of to, to meet with the NATO countries, talk about what the strategy is of NATO moving forward. I suppose there'll be a discussion like what if Putin decides to go further than Ukraine? I mean, those are the type of things that he's going to discuss. But it's a lot easier to talk to people when you're all in the same room than it is on these, you know, these telephones or video conferencing. All right. Hawaii News Now's chief national political analyst, Greta Van Susteren. Always great to see you, Greta. Thank you. Now to the state's weekly COVID numbers. The health department is reporting 14 more COVID-related deaths and 1,092 new infections. Again, this is a weekly count that's reported every Wednesday. The breakdown of cases includes 608 on Oahu, 160 on Kauai, 122 on Maui, and 107 on the Big Island. Molokai and Lanai are reporting single digits. Well, today, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates for the first time since 2018. Let's turn things over now to Michael George with more on what that means to you, me, and the economy. Whether it's groceries or used cars, consumer prices are accelerating at the fastest rate in 40 years. 
The Federal Reserve is attempting to tap the brakes on inflation by raising its key short-term interest rate one quarter of a percent. We understand that high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing and transportation. Increasing interest rates aims to drop demand to better match supply, slow the economy and eventually ease price hikes. This one rate increase is not going to really change things, but it's about a rate cycle. CBS News business analyst Jill Schlesinger says the Fed will likely approve similar rate increases several times this year. The Fed is trying to strike a balance between making sure that prices stop increasing by as much, but not raising rates so fast as that they slow the economy down so much that they cause a recession. Raising interest rates may fight inflation, but the move also makes borrowing money more expensive. Homeowners who have an adjustable rate mortgage could see their rates go up. Auto loans, student loans, and interest on credit cards will also rise slightly. Conversely, if you're a saver, you may see a small increase in the amount of interest you earn on a savings, a checking, a money market, even a CD. Schlesinger says the impact won't be seen right away and will be small at first, but expect that to change if the Fed continues to raise rates. Michael George, CBS News, New York. Changing times. Mm -hmm. All right, let's turn it over now to this live picture outside. Looking over, I think that's the Capitol grounds there. Yep. And the rest of the city. See Diamond Head there on the right-hand portion of your screen. Beautiful day. Let's see how it's going to last. Here's Billy V. He's six to eight foot surf on the North Shore. It's four to six over on the west side. Town spots are one to three and the east side's two to four. Let's take a look right now at your forecast seven days ahead. A lighter trades today. Then the trade winds really kick back in tomorrow. Kind of gusty, 10 to 20 miles per hour. And they'll remain that way all the way through Saturday. Sunday, they get light and variable. Monday, they kind of change direction. And Tuesday, it gets a little bit cooler. Get the latest on air online on your mobile device and at hawaiinewsnow.com. What is the internet talking about mm. today? And some cute stories here. And if you're a dog fan, listen up. Because the American Kennel Club says the Labrador Retriever oh. is America's favorite dog breed for the 31st oh. year in a row. 31 years. The family-friendly pooch is known for its outgoing personality and oh. eager-to-please attitude. The other top breeds are French Bulldogs. I see them all the time. Yep. Golden Retrievers, which I love. Yep. German Shepherds, awesome dog. Yep. And the Poodle also paws it way, pawed its way to the fifth spot. Poodles are okay. <laughs> <laughs> Knocking off the Bulldog for the top five. This is the first time since 2012. Then that that happened and since we're talking dogs let's get an update on ashley's new puppy why not yeah he's number one to me um he's from the humane society so i don't really know what he is we know he's a terrier mix but his paws are really big Huge. um so i think i want to try that like 23 and me oh, for dogs do yeah because yeah. i i'm dying to know how big he's gonna get but that's stanley for those unfamiliar with stanley <laughs> Awesome. He's awesome. Awesome. All right. So my favorite breed growing up had to be St. Bernard's. Mm -hmm. We had several of them on our family farm. So and cool. they were very cool. Those big Beethoven dogs. Beethoven, yeah. But I couldn't find any pictures. So all I could find is a very memorable pet to me. My first dog, Dee Dee. Oh, my God, and that John. that is me. <laughs> I'll just keep embarrassing myself. I'll drop that ticker. That's me in a diaper being chased by Dee Dee the Cocker Spaniel. Cocker Spaniel's. A little bit temperamental, but great dogs. I do remember it snapping at me a couple times, but I'm sure I deserved it. Is that your farm? No, I think that's actually the backyard of my grandparents' house. I'm okay. not sure. Oh, no, that's definitely my family's house. Not okay. exactly where the farm is, but that's our house. Look at that blonde hair. I know. What happened? So cute. <laughs> so cute. Seriously. So this is very interesting. Uh, so in Wyoming, did you know it's legal to take home roadkill. That's right. So last year, the state passed a law allowing residents to pick up dead animals from the roadways. And there's actually an app that helps confirm the animal was not killed illegally by entering the species and location where it was found. There are some restrictions and these are kind of wacky. So there are certain interstates where it's not safe to stop and collect roadkill. No one can collect roadkill at night and you can't take home grizzly bears, 
mountain goats, bighorn sheep, and some birds. You also have to take the entire carcass. For example, you can't just take the head of a deer or just those prime cuts of meat. I have heard of people doing that with deer. There's a huge population problem in parts、mm-hmm. of the Midwest,、yeah. of course. Oh, Wyoming. Well, St. Patty's Day is tomorrow, you guys. And for many, it'll involve raising a glass of your、Ooh. favorite Irish drink. And a lot of people will be toasting with a pint of Guinness. Now, did you know there is an art to the perfect pour of Ireland's famous dark brew? And apparently, it has six steps. So, first, Guinness is always poured into what's known as a gravity glass to help enhance the taste. Second, you must hold the glass at a 45 degree angle under the tap. When it's halfway full, straighten out the glass. Then, when it's about three quarters of the way full, you turn off the tap. Then, let the pint settle for exactly, get this, 119.5 seconds. Very specific. So, before finishing the pour, another pull of the tap very slowly. And some interesting history about Guinness it was created in Dublin 263 years ago and brought to the US. In 1817. Whoa, I've seen some bad Guinness pours. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, there's a new way to get to space. Here's Steve Patterson with this exclusive story. The whole experience is meant to really be immersive in the space. Worldview is one step closer to taking passengers up, up, and really far away. 23 miles above the Earth, to be exact. You're our first explorer. Inside a 10,000 pound pressurized capsule attached to a football stadium sized helium balloon. Dale Hibbs is the president of tourism and exploration at Worldview. Formerly a hospitality executive, he's been tapped to curate the space experience, all the way down to what each passenger and two crew members get to eat and drink on board the eight seat cabin. And we'll have the ability, much like a first class airline cabin or a private jet, we'll be able to have the kind of food and beverage offerings you would expect for this type of luxury travel experience. Full food options, yeah, drink full options. food options, anything you want within reason. Unlike Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic, that charge almost half a million dollars for a rocket ride that lasts a few minutes, a Worldview experience is a relative bargain at $50,000 for a seven hour trip to the edge of space, complete with a bathroom. And Wi Fi. What exactly happens when I sign up for this? You'll be with us in the spaceports for a period of five days, and we'll be、uh, entertaining you and educating you and getting you comfortable. Worldview plans to have spaceports launch from iconic locations around the world, the first two being the Grand Canyon and the Great Barrier Reef. Tell me what liftoff is going to be like. Are we going to be like this? Maybe be gripping the seat as we blast off. You won't feel any turbulence. It will be completely smooth. Since the balloon is slow and steady all the way to the stratosphere, there are no G forces or weightlessness, and there will be much more than a bird's eye view outside the capsule's large windows. Hey, you'll be able to see the stars above you and also the、yeah. balloon canopy, which will be really cool. There's a lot of competitors that are kind of gearing up for the same thing. What do you think sets the worldview experience apart from everybody else? We really don't see them as competition, we see them as other offerings. And the distinction of what we're offering is you get that time, you, know, you get that dwell time in space, you get the ability to actually soak it in and really. Experience the majesty of what is beneath you. Once the balloon lands, Worldview hopes its passengers will continue to float on air. We are looking to inspire people to、uh, understand the fragility of the planet and to come back transformed so that they're better citizens and can better support the planet. Yeah, a lot of questions. Looks interesting. How does it come down? Yeah. What happens if it keeps going? What happens if there's wind? A lot of questions, but it looks interesting. It looks like a more fun flight、a、than the other option. A cheaper alternative. Yeah, slightly cheaper. <laughs>